Uh, yeah, my name's Adam, and I, uh, I'm really glad to be with you today. I have to, just before we uh, open up the scriptures, I have to confess, my son's name is Cole, and so every time you were talking to your Cole, he's like, just prepared to give the offering message at any moment. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, I should also say, uh, I got to meet, uh, I think, someone relatively uh, new here at Memo. Did I get your name right? You and I were discussing a, a, something that brought up deep sin in my heart, and I want to confess it to all of you. And it's this, uh, the sin of extreme jealousy of Pastor Justin's perfect hair. Um, <laughs> it's true. And uh, we prayed together and really thought we heard from the Lord. And what we think is that it's fake. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there's no way it's real. Because um, <clears throat> if it is, then I have to deal with the question of how a loving God would allow... <laughs> Just playing. I'm just playing. Uh, it's good. It's good to be with you today. We, uh, you, and and our congregation online, and our congregation in Cambridge, uh, has been uh, in this teaching series called Image and Identity. And the reason that we've been in this series is because we've been trying to figure out what is a human. What what do we, what do we mean when we say us? When we say I? When we refer to someone else? When we refer to ourselves? How how do, is it that we come to understand what what we are? Now, maybe you've never asked this question yourself like directly, but indirectly, this is a question that's getting answered for you all of the time. It's getting answered for you in the kind of advertisements that you see, in the kind of songs that you listen to, in the kind of media you consume, in the movies that we watch, because if we're celebrating kind of when the, when the good guy wins and the bad guys lose or whatever, that we, we are all in there assuming what it means to be one of those guys or gals. What is a human? And what we learned in the first week is that fundamentally, like before and behind we talk about anything that humans do or what defines us in this world, we have to realize that the main thing that defines us is actually not part of this world. The main thing that defines you is actually not you. The main thing that defines you is the image of God in you, which is why humans are so awesome and so valuable, and so important from their very first moments to their very last moments, no matter what skin color the human has, or what bank account balance the human has, or how, uh, what passport that particular human holds. Humans really matter because humans look like God. This is why, by the way, when Jesus said, hey, this is the first and greatest commandment, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know why he said that? Because I can't see how you love God. No one else can either, but we can all see how you love each other. Which is why Jesus prayed in John 17, listen, God, make them all one because they're going to know, the world is going to know that they love you and me, God, by the way they love each other. And so this has been a huge part of, of this series, asking ourselves, well, how, how do we human well if we don't know what we are? And so in the following week, we, we learned that humans, we've got enormous capacity. But very often we use our capacity not commensurate with enormous responsibility, right? Like humans can do amazing things. You all have a supercomputer in your pocket. Like that's unusual historically, okay? Um, if you've ever had a perfectly cooked chocolate chip cookie, which by the way, the Bible says, is hard on the outside and squishy on the inside. That's, that's in the Bible. If you've ever had one of those, yes. Um, that's like we can make those. We, we, humans are amazing. We also can kill each other at scale and create whole systems of government or economics that put one group of us over another group of us. We can step on one another for our own gain. We use our capacity now irresponsibly because that's what sin does. Sin is when I take the image of God in me and the capacity that God has given me and don't use it for you, but use it for me. And so following that, we learn that, well, Okay, th then that means that we've been really hurt by sin. We're, we're image bearers, but we're also really messed up by sin, which means that because we're hurt, we continue to perpetuate hurt. And last week we looked at a little bit about how such hurt breaks us all apart and how God wants to put us back together again. And so I want to carry forth that idea. If God wants to recombine you into something bigger than just your constituent parts, Something more than just your mind or your body or your emotionality. If, God, if the God of the gospel is putting you back together so that you can fully present yourself lovingly toward him and toward others, then that has to mean something for the way we relate to each other, right? Like, if, if I'm being renewed by God, if Jesus is changing my life, if I'm actually learning what it means to be human, then at some point that has to affect how I treat you. Yeah? 
Yes. So today, that's what I would like to talk to you about. Very brief scripture today, Genesis 2, verse 18 through 20. I'll read, we'll pray, and then God is going to speak to us. Genesis 2 says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Just underline that. It is not good that the man should be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called them, uh, that was its name, the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper fit for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, would you help us as we study the scriptures today? Lord, open our eyes, soften our hearts. God, I know that there are some in this room who just, man, showing up full of faith, loving your word. And Lord, there are some in this room showing up really not sure about Christianity, not sure about you, God. Lord, you know where we all are on that spectrum of spirituality. Take us from where we are closer to you. Speak to each one of us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes we have a difficult time living together. You could laugh now. Like, that's, that's one of those obvious things. You're like, wow, he went to school for that. Yeah. Like, yeah, if you open your phone uh, or turn on the television or open your laptop or whatever, you would find that we don't always get along. And I'm not even just talking, like, in your family or your personal relationships. I'm talking, like, just even nationally. And these last couple of years have really highlighted some of the fault lines in our own national community. Three weeks ago, we saw racist walk into a grocery store in upstate New York and mow down a bunch of African Americans because they didn't look like him. This week, we saw a, I believe, a a Chinese gentleman, Chinese national, walk into a Taiwanese church and kill about 13 of them. This kind of stuff happens a lot. And we look at that and we go, oh, that's bad. But very rarely do we ever go any deeper to ask, could it be that the thing that we really believe about each other has something to do with why that stuff can happen? Because that's wrong. God hates that. We hate that. The right moral response for you is to really hate that because it's hateful. God hates it. But he also has profound love and compassion for those who are hurt by sin. Right? You know those two things can live together in the same heart, right? So, when we think about, okay, why, why is this so hard? What, what is it that's happening to us? I want to offer to you a possible explanation this morning from the scriptures. I think part of the possible explanation is that we prefer us, I prefer me, and you tend to prefer you, and that's the way we like it. And yet, inside of each one of us is a profound desire to belong, a profound desire to have others in our lives with whom we can feel like we've got family and we've got community. That's what you're faking yourself out as having on your phone. Hashtag Insta family. You don't have an Insta family. Okay, no one has an Insta family, all right? Hey, Facebook fam. There's no Facebook fam, unless you are on Facebook with your actual family. Now, why am, I, why am I picking on social media? Because we figured out a way to have the diet cola version of real human relationships just enough so we get all the great taste with less filling. We figured out a way to sort of inoculate ourselves to real community and real life-on-life relationships by having just enough so that we don't actually catch the real thing. But we, my friends, you and I were made to be individuals in community. Like, that's what we were made to be. Now, some of you are like, ah, yes, but see, Pastor Adam, you are an extrovert. But I, I, you see, I am an introvert. Well, first of all, don't, you don't know me, all right? Second of all... (laughs) 
I am a bit of an introvert uh, now. Uh, that's what ministry's done to me. Uh, <laughs> I started out six and a half feet tall with refulgent black hair. And this is just, this is what happens. Um, no, I, I, I get it. Some of us just, we like to be out there in the crowd, and others of us just, you know, would rather uh, visit the crowd and then go hide in a dark room alone. That's fine. That has nothing to do with your human need for relationships. Your introversion or extroversion just refers to how you kind of get recharged emotionally. And some of you get recharged at a party, and others of you get recharged at a library. That's okay. The problem is we still don't figure out how to, how to f- function together. Some of us think, well, it's the, it's the community, it's the relationships out there that are kind of pressing in on me and keeping me from being who I'm called to be. It's my family, it's my culture, it's society, it's the system, whatever that refers to, that's keeping me from being truly me. Okay, Maybe. And so because of that, we hyper-individualize everybody and we take at face value anything that feels like your deep emotionality, that, that's got to be the truest, you you part of you. And so our, our whole culture right now says that if I love you, I just got to affirm whatever nonsense may or may not come out of your mouth about you. That's not loving, by the way. That's actually terribly convenient for me to feel like I've loved you without actually doing the hard work of loving you. Because if I love you, I actually have to go, hey, I love you. That sounds crazy. You aren't that. You aren't that. My son Cole is here with me. I don't know if you remember this, buddy, but around seven, you were deeply convinced that you were, in fact, a Jedi. (laughs) Right? Now, obviously, we're like, oh, of course, not a Jedi, but, you know, carry that same impulse into the age of, I don't know, 17, and we suddenly take it real seriously. You know, not about being a Force user, um, though that would be really convenient for moving things around the house, but about what we feel we are. Others of us go on the other side and say, man, everybody, the problem is with, all, with the world's all these individuals. We just need to like, get back to community. But the reality is we were made to be individuals in community, not individuals or community. Now, if you go around the globe, you'll find some cultures that are like, your individuality doesn't matter. You're in a family. You're in a community. Sit down, shut up, play your role. Those tend to be more in the global south these days. And here in the north and west of the globe, we tend to be a bit more individualistic, right? Pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Now, there are all kinds of interesting historical reasons for this, but neither one of them are right fully. Who you are, your individual destiny and purpose and calling is unimaginably important. Your Bible says that God has been thinking about you from before the foundations of the world, that he knit you together in your mother's womb, that all of the days ordained for you were were written in his book before one of them came to be, that he knows you before and behind. He's got the number of hairs on your head counted, which is more of a miracle for him than for me, but you get it. God knows you, and he cares deeply about your destiny. And God knows us and cares deeply about our community. We were made to be individuals in community. And so we come to this text and we come here as those who are involved in something that I like to call the I, we, war. Is it individuality that matters or is it us? Is it community that matters? And we fight this war along all kinds of lines. Does does what I want to do and my own life matter more and my feeling of happiness matter more than my family's needs from me? Do, do I just need to, you know, do whatever ever they need, or am I, is it really all about me and they're holding me down? Do you, this is how men my age get divorced. See? Is it my money? I'm like, y'all just get your hands off of it and leave me alone with all these taxes? Or is it ours? Is it, is it my time, or is it, is it yours? Is this my body, or is it my, am I united with my, do you see how confusing this can become? We, we fight the I, we war along all kinds of battle lines, from parenting to politics, from who we are to who we sleep with, from societal norms to self-help bestsellers. We like to fight along these lines, which is weird because it, this, this makes us, uh, uh, what's the Greek term? Raging hypocrites. Raging hypocrites, because on the one hand, we really want to matter, right? We want to live our best life, right? We want to go to school, get the job, you know, buy the house, have the 2.1 children, the white picket fence or something like that. And yet, 
We've never been more lonely. Did you know that? You've never been more able, there have never been more resources available to you to figure out who you are and to go express you all over the place. It's never been easier to become educated. We've never had better health care, and we've never as a planet been more wealthy than we are right now. Now, I know some of you are like, well, it needs to get better. Yeah, okay, no doubt. But for, for the history of how we've been, we're the wealthiest, the strongest, the smartest, the cleanest, and the most technologically advanced we've ever been. And we have the worst mental health we have ever had. We are the loneliest we have ever been. It amazes me. A pastor church in Cambridge, right in between Harvard and MIT, there are a lot of human beings per square foot, okay? And raging as a problem in our congregation is loneliness. And I'm like, how can you be lonely? You're on top of each other. The problem isn't geography, my friends. The problem is that we don't know what it means to be part of humanity. That's the problem. We were made to be individuals in community. So what I want to do really quickly is show you how, show you why that's hard, and show you how it gets better. How is it the, how is it the case that we were made to be individuals in community? Okay, God makes a human, an Adam. Okay, Adam, Adam, Greek or Hebrew word for dirt. So I don't know what your name means, but mine means dirt. All right? And so God makes the world. And then he says in Genesis 1, 26, let us make men in our own image and after our likeness. And so, in the image of God, he made him, male and female, he made them, and then he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. He makes human beings as not just image bearers passively, but imagers actively, so that now you have a job. I have a job. It is the case that no matter who I am, no matter what I do, no matter how old or how young or how rich, poor, whatever, I I always bear the image of God and imaging God is is a duty. It is my moral responsibility and I'm, Not always doing it well. But here in the garden, God makes humans that look like him. Which, by the way, do you know why God says everywhere else to the right of this in the Bible, don't make idols? Don't make little fake images of God? Here's why. He's already made his own image. You. Don't need to make little fake ones out of wood. Look around. C.S. Lewis said that if we ever saw a human as they truly were, we would be tempted to fall down and worship them. Humans are amazing. And when when God made us, he he made this first human, but there's there's a distinction. I don't know if you heard it in the text. God says, let us make man after our own image and in our, like there's this plural language. But then he makes the human, the one human. There seems to be this community and unity within God and then this individuality for this human. And so God says, all right, human, I want you to name stuff. And so, all right, uh, cow, chicken, steak? No, not yet. Uh, Okay, sorry, I'm hungry. Uh, That's where it all went. Um, You don't eat animals until later in the Bible. But anyway, and names all the animals. Finally gets to the end, like, you know, Peregrine falcon or something, whatever was the end. And the Bible says, but a a helper suitable for him wasn't found among them. That that the world God made is absolutely amazing and all these creatures and nature and, and it's glorious and beautiful, but there was something he was missing. And then the first thing, the first time this phrase ever shows up in your Bible, says, it wasn't good. Something wasn't good. Now, that's weird because in the previous chapter, God had called the world good seven times, which, by the way, when the Bible repeats itself seven times at you, it's clapping in your face like this. It's saying, hey, 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 it was really, really quite good, right? So we were just told it was super, perfectly, completely, really, really clap in your face good. And then something wasn't good. And what wasn't good was that this human was alone. Now, I know that this is where we also get the institution of marriage and, and all of that. I, I don't want to talk about that directly right now. I just simply want to talk about the fact that God looked at this one human made in his image, and it wasn't good that he was alone. Now think about this one step further. Not only did he have all of creation and all the animals and all the critters, he had God. Some of you are very extra super holy. You're like, I don't need to join a community group. I don't need to join a team. I really don't even really need to be in this church very much because I have God. Okay. 
I love it when people are more spiritual than the pastor. It's awesome. Uh, like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Close up, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Adam had God more perfectly than you do. Like, walked with him, saw his face, hung out with God, took nature walks with the Lord, and it wasn't good that he was alone. Look, I hope that you know Jesus. I want you to have a deep, communicative, profound relationship with God. I want that more and more, too. But that same God who made me, who is the all-satisfying, glorious, good creator of the universe and the cosmos and the redeemer of all things, has decided in his sovereignty that I need you and you need each other. Yeah? We were made this way. Why? Because this is part of what it means to image God's glory. This is part of what it means to take that, that image of God likeness out into the world. And so he makes these two humans... And he puts them in the garden to do the things, to work it, to keep it, to make babies and families and gardens and, and expand this glorious thing that he'd got started on into the world. That's what we were made. We were made, human beings were made at the very beginning, individual and community. How did it go so wrong? Well, you already know the answer to that. It's the most commonly correct answer in Sunday school after Jesus, which is sin. It's sin. We turned our backs on God, and, and sin has therefore now made community and individuality very difficult. Sin has broken us individually, and it has hurt community. When we broke fellowship with God, we did so selfishly. Do you, do you, if you have a Bible, you can open it to Genesis 3, and you can see this. Serpent comes, you know, hey, Eve, did God really say? But look at that tree, it's really nice. And then here's what happens. The, the writer of Genesis says, and so she looked at it, she saw it, that it was desirous to make her wise. So she took and she ate. Do you hear how individualistic all that language is? She wasn't thinking about Adam. She wasn't thinking about God. She wasn't thinking about her future progeny. She wasn't thinking about the animals. She wasn't thinking about anything else. She was thinking about number one. That is always why relationships are hard. When I prefer my wife and my own, or when I prefer my own comfort and my own uh, desires over my wife's, within a handful of moments, there will be a confrontation. When I prefer myself over my church, within a handful of moments, something will happen. Normally, I'll feel this temptation to become bitter. Why, man, I just, I deserve better than this. Why would I be treated this way? I, I, me, I desire, does this sound familiar? Yeah, sure it does. That's why community is so dang hard. And so what we do as a fake version of community is that we get around people who all have the same desires as us. See, this is very smart. So if I want a thing and you want that thing, maybe you can help me get that thing. And we can talk about how horrible all the people who don't want that thing are. God, they, right? You know? It's like the people who like Star Wars and the people who like the first three and the last three. They're very different people. <laughs> and if you like the last three and the first three, we'll have an altar call for you later, um, I guess. That was a joke. You can laugh. Thanks. <laughs> but we, we, become, we become false communities of affinity, which is... Why we divide up into tribes. Oh, your skin tone is like mine. You make about the same group amount of money as me. You have the exact same desire for power that I do. D does that sound familiar? And then we call that community. Think about social media. How is social media brought together? Through likes. I mean, can it be any more on the nose? Like, those aren't... You Community are the people you, you just are with. Like, it, you didn't choose those with whom you got to done been born against, you know? Like, the, I, didn't, I didn't, I wasn't up as an unembodied soul going, mm, those three. Like, you know? You, you're forced into this human world, and then if you believe that God did that, then you have to trust that he was wise to do it. Like, all right, 
You put me in this church. Okay, you put me in this town. Okay, you put me in this street. Okay, you put me in this job. Okay, you put me in this family. And I don't think that you're dumb. And I don't think that you hate me. Okay. Sin makes this hard. However, what Jesus does is redeem us individually for new community. So here's what's cool. Jesus comes and he lives perfectly. He builds a new humanity, a huge, like a whole theme for you to read the Gospels through later is like all the ways Jesus was rebooting creation. You can start with John, it's super interesting. But one of the things that he's doing there is creating a new group of humans to live out the, the renewed version of the human mission, right? And, and so part of the way he gets that off the ground isn't just by saying, okay, work hard and go do that. He says, okay, I'm going to show you what it's like to be a human. I'm going to give you the ethics of the kingdom of God and the new humanity. And then, because that's going to be impossible for you, and because if you try and fail, God is going to judge you because you're going to eventually hate each other and prefer yourself. I'm going to take all of that on myself. I'm going to take all of that as, uh, of your sin and of your anger and of your selfishness, and I'm going to die. And take all that hellishness and leave it there in hell and rise three days later, conquering all of that stuff, and distributing to you not just my forgiveness, but my very spirit. Do you know that what enabled Jesus to do what he did on the earth wasn't the fact that he was Jesus merely? Everything good that Jesus accomplished, he did because he was full of the Holy Spirit, completely oriented toward the Father. full of the Holy Spirit, which is why he would say crazy, crazy things like, hey, you know all this cool stuff I've been doing? You're going to do cool stuff, actually cooler stuff than me, in my name. <laughs> okay, Jesus. You know, it's like a parent when he's trying to encourage, you know, like, I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be great one day. You could be president. That's what, maybe that's what Jesus was doing. That's not what Jesus was doing. He was saying, I've been doing everything I've been doing by the power and by the presence and by the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus dies and he rises and he gives the Holy Spirit to the church, not just so that we can feel sort of like a tingle down our left leg when Jess is really crushing it in worship. That's not the only reason that the Holy Spirit came. We were given the Holy Spirit so that we can actually understand the word of God, so that we can love one another, so that there can be a power source from heaven that allows me to overcome my own selfishness and anger and greed so that I can get over those things and love you even when it costs me more to love you than I would like for it to cost me to love you. Because love is always costly. We have been loved by one who has paid the ultimate cost so that we could what? Be redeemed individuals in community. Here's the cool thing about all this is that even if you feel lonely and even if you feel like, ah, this isn't for me, this isn't just part of our story. This is the very nature of God himself. We're going deep this morning. We're talking about the fundamental nature of God. He is not just one. Okay? Wrong religion, if you think that. He is one God, eternally existent in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in unity, three in community, always together. So confusing we had to invent a word for it called Trinity, a three oneness. The very nature of God is that He is both I and we. That God is both individuality and community. And so here's what's really cool is when He makes us in His image, He makes us like that. So that I am me, but I have no idea what that means without you. And that you are you, and you don't matter more than me. We all matter more than that fly. No, you don't matter more than me. This is the wonderful tension of being a follower of Jesus, is that in order for me to be who I am, I have to be in spiritual family. And in order for my spiritual family to be what it is, it needs me. This is why the Apostle Paul said crazy things like, look, the church is kind of like a body, and not everybody's like a nose, because that would be disgusting. The body has different parts, and God puts it all together, and so you got to know that. you got to know your role. you got to get in the body, because otherwise you're a disembodied nose, which is gross. That's what it's like. I'm going to be a Christian by myself with the Lord at home. Nose on the ground. Gross. <laughs> Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Also useless, right? Nose on the ground by itself. Just not even working as a nose. 
So I started by saying we seem to have a deep level of confusion about what it means to be human, an individual in community, right? And I kind of showed you some news stories to that effect. What if we lived differently? Like, do you realize that the church is not just meant to be this building that incre increasingly gets cooler and cooler, which it is, praise God, where you come and, like, you hear about Jesus stuff and then go and be individuals? No, my friends. We are, we have a building, that's cool, but we're, we're here to be a new community. We are here to be a new spiritual family. That's why we use that language. Now, some of you say, okay, but pastor, I'm super lonely, and, like, I just, I don't think that people here would love me. Everyone thinks that at times. That's not true. There are all kinds of people here who would love you. They love me. Do you have any idea how difficult that is? Pastor Justin can tell you. I say, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. Okay. But pastor, I'm not going to be here for very long. I hate this excuse. Here's why. My most important relationships today at the age of 38 were formed in an 18-month period at the age between 19 and 20. My marriage, my deep covenant friendships, my spiritual family. I got through college in two years, okay? I hustled, I overloaded, because I really, really, really wanted to marry my wife. But at some point, some campus minister got in my face and was like, you're going to live your life so quickly you forget to live it. While you're here, be here. Students, I, I get it. You're like, look, I got, I got class. I've got all these things. I know. I know. You're going to go change the world. Just don't forget to be changed by Jesus before you go try. Otherwise, you'll just mess up the world in new and creative ways. <laughs> so I don't, know, I don't know what my future holds. Neither do I. The Bible says that. Do not worry about tomorrow. While you're here, sow, and you will reap. So I'm, I'm leaving in a year. Okay, make it better than you found it. What if we lived that way? Come on. What if like every place that you were in throughout life, I think, you know, statistics are that you'll have four major career moves in your life or four different major seasons in your life. Okay, let's say you lived in four different cities. Do each version better. Don't wait 15 months until it sort of feels like home. Go make it home because you can't be you without us and we can't be us without you. You are an individual in community. That's how you were made to be. And praise God, because of Jesus, all that stuff that makes it hard can be forgiven, can be set free. And here, if you mess up, that's cool. Everyone else here is messed up too. They just did it before you did it. You didn't get to see it. We've already forgiven them. So come on in, right? Come on in. Let's just, we all need Jesus. We all just get in line at the mercy of Jesus so that we can learn how to do this thing together. Is it hard? Yeah. Is it worth it? Yes, because everything worth it is hard. But like what if, come on, like what if like a year from now when you're not in this room anymore and you got to have a couple services upstairs in that room, we are like, there's so much community happening, I think we need to buy more rooms. I would love it just as the senior pastor of this organization if you made my, my job, the hard part of my job, needing to find more real estate. Do that. I'll take up that challenge. Like, oh, we just, there's just so much community. There's so many people in homes and meeting each other and caring for one another. Where are we going to put them all? I'll figure it out, Okay. We'll figure it out. Like, what if we live that way? Come on, Providence doesn't live that way. Boston doesn't live that way. But in Jesus, we could live that way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, I, I'm asking you, God, for two important things, I think, today. Well, the first thing that I'm asking you to do is, um, God, there are men and women here, they just, they don't know you, so they, they don't know how to be in spiritual family. And God, we want, we want to see that change. The most important family that we can be in is your family. The most important relationship we can have is with you. And so, Father, I'm asking today, right now, that you would, in this room, touch hearts, uh, touch minds, touch lives in such a way that, um, that those who don't know you would know you. That those who don't know you would, would put faith and put trust in you. I know we don't often do that in our, do this in our congregations, but and I, I just want to ask you, if there's any one of you that would, um, that would say, hey, I want to know Jesus the way that man is talking about. I don't, but I want to. I would love for you to throw your hand up. I just want to pray for you. 
There's nothing magical about this. No one's going to come to your house and knock on your door. But praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm just going to wait here for a moment. I think the Holy Spirit's wanting to do some amazing stuff. God loves you, my friends, and like he wants you to be in his family. So much so, he's signed all the, all the paperwork. He's paid all the price. He's gotten all the attorney's lanes. He's done all that hard work of adopting you and me into his family. He doesn't give us an entrance exam. He doesn't say, okay, try real hard first and we'll see. He just says, hey, trust me. I love you. So if you got your hand up right now, I just want you to pray this with me. Jesus, I trust you and I love you and I want to be in your family. Jesus, I trust you and I love you and I want you to be my family. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my treasure. I want you to be my savior. I want you to move everything out of the way that keeps me from you. God, I want to be in your family. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, um, probably one of our staff, one of our pastors might come and tap you on the shoulder. Don't get freaked out. It's because they love you and they want to just agree with you and talk to you about what that might mean as a next step. But praise God that, that this is what he loves to do. For the rest of you, I want to challenge you and encourage you. There is no perfect church. And if there was one, we'd ruin it as soon as we walked in. <laughs> But you're here. And though there is no perfect church, this one's yours. And while you're here, I want to I want to encourage you, I want to invite you, I want to exhort you. Be in. Be in. Go all in for spiritual family, man, because God loves to do mighty things through his family. So Father, would you move in us, move among us now? Can I ask you to stand? We're gonna respond in a time of worship and singing.